Well, hello to everyone. I'm really very happy to uh, actually walk you to this round table before the presentation from our minister. We'll be talking from the repaired patient to the augmented human being, and we'll be really uh, talking more and looking more at the future of medicine. We'll be looking at different uh, points of view, scientific ones, first of all, with uh, Pierre Marie Ledo, who will be talking from the neural scientific point of view. We we have Claire Rogel uh, Gaillard who will be talking about the genetics, uh, genomics, uh, and especially in the animal area. And then we have uh, the prototypes who will be talking about the patients who repaired or augmented. And then uh, so that was with Nicola. And then with Jean Michel, we'll be talking about the philosophical area. The questions to start is. In fact, the next step of medicine is it to, we've heard that Facebook was talking about eradicating death, and since it was in uh, Alpha Maison, the, the house of Google's in 2013, was saying their aim was to eradicate death. We heard other announcements from Silicon Valley, from Neuralink, with Elmo Musk, all in this perspective and this idea that in, thanks to science associated with technology could reinvent the medical field and potentially could even go beyond the limits of what is a human being. Now, to really debate this question, and we can, there's so much information in the scientific environment, science is progressing very well, knowledge as well. And so we have the stem cells research, for example, and genetics was what Claire will talk about. But also, artificial intelligence is where we're progressing as well. We're talking about the progress in the different implants, genotherapy, when we talk about neuroscience. Science, we'll be talking about that. All of this uh, in leads us to think that, yes, uh, the Silicon Valley actors that talk to us about the augmented human being or transhumanism, maybe there's something in there. Now, I have a first question for my uh, panelists. What is this augmented man that we're talking about? And in your opinion, from your different scientific perspectives or ethical perspectives, now, is it this is the course of history, or we're going to, it's going to happen in any case? Is it a hope for you? Is it something that will mean progress? And possibly, or is it going to be really a nightmare? Now, to, I will start with Pierre-Marie Ledo. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everyone. Yes, the question was to know if we're going to go from the repaired patient to augmented man. I think chronologically speaking, we've already been augmented, augmented before being repaired. Now, a lot before me have been talking about this homo faber, which to, ex in fact, to be accelerating these evolutions, that we've already seen how much the human being uh, for uh, oh, over some thousands and thousands of years, man has wanted to delegate these human services through tools. It could be different uh, from for different tools like fire and other kinds of elements. We've already had this externalization, this exotomization, and so in this uh, cinematic area, there was no problem. So we externalized the skeleton uh, from this lever. We externalized also. So through the different muscles, the machine, the actually muscles are machines because you have heat, and the third form of extermination is what causes the problem. This is why we're coming together today, because it's to externalization thoughts, the, the cogni cognitive thoughts outside of the human body, and we should never forget the human being was selected, and that we talk about Darwin, evolution theory, and so there really is, really is so really we have this a, a social uh, mentality already, and so to feel the emotions of our others. We already have this. Now, creating these kinds of tools, we 
also have a this is the artifact because behind these tools the anthropomorphological situation you can see these intentions and we're talking about artificial intelligence but now currently everyone is working on uh, artificial emotions when you talk to a person now if there you can already see the intonation of someone's voice so that really you can interpret that and that means that there'll be positive message or not negative ones but you can detect that already now the danger is what we need to talk about there is this loop because we we will see through this machine we will see a human being because we and we are reading their emotions so we're in this loop so that and, and we already entered into this kind of merge between the human being and the machine this merge between the two has already started now the question that one can raise in fact because all of these externalization functions in, in general the idea was to give freedom and, what, and liberate, but we see that there's really a slavery, however, there's a deterioration of freedom, in fact, liberty, because we have this illusion. It's a narcissistic kind of effect, and hum mankind is, is really going out of this project. We call the teleonomics. To go into this project, we have not really discussed enough. We don't really know the outcome, and we can see some uh, mercantile, merchandise projects, but we, say human, we don't see human in the nature. So in fact, we have a continuity, but the fact of really let's, it really to mix man and the machine raises questions. Yes, it is a breakthrough. It's an innovative breakthrough. Now, Claire, from your point of view and the point of view of your expertise, what do you think about this question of augmented man? Well, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. I come from the agricultural sector. So basically, all, in fact, we are going to have more of this being applied to plants and to animals and the connection with humans, of course, is uh, something also that we, we we talk about the health area. The health sector is important for us. Now, I wanted to really go back to what we've heard from Pierre-Marie, that biology already has given us the augmented man. I'll give you three examples that are from different scales. The individual ones, we've already been augmented thanks to our microbiota because all the different microbians with which we live. So if we look at in a microscope, we would be seeing uh, we would have these microorganisms and that would really give us a different way of looking at ourselves. And so, in fact, so over the time, uh, we had different functions thanks to this microbiota. They enable us to digest uh, and they is in connection with the brains as well. So th this we've already been augmented thanks to this microbiota. Another example, if we go out of the individual and we go into the collective area, we can consider that a collective vaccination, for example, can protect us collectively. We talk about uh, collective immunity, and so this can uh, augment us as a group. Now, when we can transmit this augmented to our descendants, well, I give you the example of this uh, food transition, which in fact enabled us to really get new functions over time, and they can also be transmitted biology in different generations. Now, the question of augmentation, we'll be really looking at this. Now, how, what are the different resources that we need, in fact, to ensure our augmentation, to assume, to choose it, and, and make it interesting for mankind? Very well taken, this point. Now, Nicola, from your point of view of as a patient, now, I would like already to s s start with the base, I uh, philosophical approach. I think that's good to start like that. So, niche, uh, OK. Uh, well, it's, to, it's better to start with Nietzsche. So Nietzsche was giving this, uh, this sentence that comes from Nietzsche. Man is really between the uh, is really the different tie between the monkey and the Superman. Now are we yes yes a human being is seeking improvement continuously perfection and yes it's logical that today in our world and in that human being is always seeking to improve to have a turn no life, etc., etc. So this is the direction of the history. Yes, yeah, so this is really the logic, I believe, that we should really be base this discussion on. Now, what is a superman, a, su a superhuman being, already to, to really have balance 
what we can realize that with different eras and different environments and their different histories, the vision of a superman and perfect man is differs. If I just take the Nazi Germany, superhuman was really an Aryan. If I take the US in, in the 80s, the superhuman was Superman. And if I take today in our area, the superhuman would be the transhuman, the bionic man. So we all have to agree that this vision of an augmented, augmented or perfect man is something that we, for each society has their, and even each individual has their own way of looking at it. Now, bionic man in that area, I can talk to you about that because this uh, in France, too, uh, we had this bionic uh, documentary, and I was the main uh, um, um, actor because I have a high-tech prosthesis, so I'm bionic, and this process really cost a lot, a lot of money. So, and it's a Dutch qualität, so it's a German quality, and so you can see, in fact, that... Well, yes, I, you, you couldn't have a truck roll over me, I could put my hand in the fire. Now, am I an augmented hu human being? So, so, and also, do you consider me as an augmented human being? I'm going to show you something. Here, I'm going to take off my jacket, and then I see, and, uh, uh, well, but actually, augmented human being cannot take off his jacket because he can't get, the prosthesis won't uh, actually allow him to do that. So it's very important for me to share this experience because we idealize, we have this dream, which is normal, the human being, augmented human being. And in fact, people that have these auditive, uh, if they have hearing aids, for example, do they hear better? No. But we have a fantastic machine, which is our body. A hand is also really a camera, because we put our hand in our pocket. We can see, we can feel what's in our pocket. With a prosthesis, we can't do that. Now, it'd be very difficult to have this sensation with a prosthesis, as you can have with your a human hand. So a human being is really fantastic. And so already 20 years I've been amputated, 20 years I have this prosthesis, and 10 years now that I've been trying to uh, make a prosthesis with a 3D implant when I discovered this uh, fab lab. This is when I started this, a fab lab. I opened one with an association we created, and the fab lab that we had is a human lab. And this is the first human lab in France. It is a fab lab, a laboratory with digital technology dedicated to objects for persons of, that are disabled. And so we realize that in our lab, we are, don't have this question of augmentation. Rather, we're really trying to rehabilitate a man. You can go, he can go to the uh, internet. He wants to have an autonomous life. Uh, a person in this situation wants to really be autonomous, I'm saying. So an augmented human being is not in the order of genetics or robotics. No, it's the intellectual capacity to really uh, realize that he is capable of questioning him or herself, and for me, augmented human being is someone who is in the capacity to act very fine. Jean-Michel Beignet, uh, what, you have a very, what is your point of view concerning this augmented human being, what it is, and the risks connected to this ideology? Yes, in fact, first of all, I don't want to forget that this expression, uh, augmented human being, really was to translate the American enhancement, enhancement which is something which the transhuman is actually practiced, to improve or augment. We chose augmented. So we played with the quantitative rather than the qualitative. This seems to be an important point to really underline. It's not uh, the, it's really an augmented rather than uh, improved human being. Now I was listening to Nicola and I really, uh, really know the direction he's going. But within this sham this year, in fact, I was attentive to the fact that this is the patient that we need to talk about, a patient. And my general question is the following. How can we 
ensure that the connected medicine is not a diminished medicine. I have been seeing for some years now the publication of different works from doctors that are, have the argumentation and they object to the development of uh, uh, this uh, kind of blood medicine, the me uh, in other words, the medicine without is the question. So it's a medicine without. So, okay, we see the emergence of these connected uh, objects, these robots, uh, and this uh, they substitute to doctors in, in flesh and, and minds. So, the, so in other words, there was also another publication, the medicine without the body. This, um, we see this development, the disappearance, for example, of to touch uh, the patient to olfactory uh, senses that would be part of the consultation, telemedicine, uh, which is at a distance, not face to face. And this will confirm this uh, uh, medicine without the body. And what my argument today, maybe we'll talk a little about this, which is uh, uh, the medicine without any uh, any uh, voices without, not oral. So it would be uh, really catching the signals, but not the signs. The signals, you have a certain junction. In, in other words, a signal is a message that we emit, and that it, it actually uh, requires a reaction. And so so you have one, we dialogue. We have one signal, and then, then you also, it's like a ping pong match. We dialogue together. We have, the, thanks to these signals, we have this human perspective and not a, a technocratic or a mechanical or machine-based one. You don't have this in the augmented human being? Well, the augmented, augmented human being enables us to, in fact, he has a very wide area. In fact, when I was talking about the augmented human being, in the public areas, people are saying, well, I have uh, 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 glasses, so I'm an augmented human being. No, I'm a human being that has been rehabilitated or a repaired patient, as Nicola was talking about. So the augmented human being, from that I was talking about that with the pacemaker, for example. With the pacemaker, we do have this uh, cybernetics uh, device, which is autonomous, which actually uh, colonizes, is one way of putting it, our body. But the man who wears contact lenses, for example, with Zoom, is maybe augmented. So in other words, this person has a cognitive performance, which is higher. So when a transhumanist talk about augmented human beings, they're talking above all about the human being, for example, which would have different uh, certain brain uh, implants that they could interact with the machine. So we have this augmentation because we're not in this form or the standard of what is a human being and the augmented human being. This is the one who would result from CRISPR-Cas9, this possibility of, delete, of editing the genome so we'd be capable of sampling the gene presumed res to be responsible for this different uh, uh, allocation from the uh, bats or something the, uh, different. We can also get, we can put, for example, the uh, from sharks implants that we can put in the fetus, which we could then, that's what we call by augmented human beings. So in the public debate, we have a gap between, for example, when we talk about aug augmented human being, which you have these acceptance that are interesting, as Claire was mentioning, and then we have this vision, which is more extreme, which is from certain different actors, which was, for example, from the transhumanistic circle. I would like to talk about the dream, because we're living in this era. Well, it's a fantastic. We have a lot of scientific progress, technological progress. We've spoken ab about some of them already. And I really am asking this question about science today. Uh, as Is it the remedy, as Pierre-Marie was saying? What does it enable? What does it enable us to do? at least from the point of view of knowledge, that would really be a revolution in the medical field. I would like to hear you, Claire. 
well, yes, we are in this period where I do believe that our knowledge in DNA, genomes, this knowledge was never at such a high point. And so this gives an enormous potential, as we've just heard from about the editing of genomes. And then after having done these different, uh, I've looked at these different genomes, different species, so we understand better the functionality. We progressively are identifying the genes responsible for different functions. There are some that are very complex, which, uh, in fact, it's not by modifying one gene which we'll be able to modify the functions. But at the same time, progressively, we're putting our finger on those that are responsible for different diseases, so these uh, monogenetic situations. And so we can have the aim to really modify specifically a certain number of genes so that we will be able to eradicate different major pathologies. We can repair organs which, in fact, have, have different uh, dysfunction because of a gene. So this knowledge in the genetic field, we talk about the dream, this can enable us to eradicate a certain number of uh, problems. And we can also find ourselves in a situation always coming from the agricultural sector that I represent, we have lots of different issues, legal issues, acceptance of choices, feasibility. But basically, if we put this in a debate about, the, for example, um, modifly, genetically modified plants, for example, which in some countries are not accepted and eth ethically not accepted, or also problem, environmental problem, biological problem, these are important issues. But we can find ourselves in a situation to to really take and care for a patient means that we have uh, we're in a different level so we can make decisions which in fact are there's a lot of differentiation that between what we could do for example to repair and augment a human being and so what we would decide for nature which in fact has to have this uh, uh, less ideas than what we could really choose for a human being so I think this debate is something that is really interesting and uh, yes you have the international level also. Well, Nicola, you were talking to us a little about the dream. And now, does it make you dream this bionic man? The internet really made me dream, really dream about these prostheses and internet. In fact, uh, and, and the image makes frustration, though, because we want to uh, have access to something. For example, poverty makes people poor. We we can't we we have a lot of frustration because we have all these desires, we, things we can't have. And I always dream to, to simply say that to have the bionic hand. In fact, in the project that I'm involved in today, and I consider myself as an expert patient. And this enabled me to have access to John Hopkins University, the latest uh, uh, prosthesis and the most uh, uh, sophisticated technology. So we do fantastic things. But the question is, why do you, can you move your fingers? Now, how can I do it? With two functions, I can do everything. What is the point in having a prosthesis which restitutes all the movements is how, if it weighs too much, like 25 kilos, how can you wear that in, on an amputated limb? How can you uh, have uh, this uh, limb that's too, this process thesis that's too, uh, uh, that weighs too much. Yes, we're in the dream, as you're saying. Yeah, the dream, we're in a company that's going to do this process uh, for the, the different uh, uh, upper arm. We may put a lot of access. Uh, uh, to this. Now, when I had my accident uh, in 20 years ago, we just had one model. It was really, looked really horrible. And the, the surgeon was doing the best he could, but he said, you're going to have another, a new hand, he said. And I was under morphine, and I said, oh, my God, I'm going to have a new hand. But when I saw what it looked like on a video, and when somebody could, uh, who can't open up even your car, the, the really, uh, the those uh, um, prostheses were really different than now. Now we have these prostheses that really can be adapted to phones, but it does not increase the acceptance of the patients. One out of 10 patients gets a prosthesis from social security insurance, and seven out of 10, in fact, uh, they they ju they just keep them in their cupboards. So. 15,000 is the cost, and then you have re-education, and the time was processed, so you need about 50,000 euros that we're talking about. You multiply this by seven people, for example, so this is a lot of money. We're talking about deficiencies, and this is what interests me. How can we be efficient? How can we have patients that are experts, and, and so how can we have patients who really have this desire? How can we give them this desire that they have access to the technology? I had this 3D printing process, so I can also 
also learn how to really produce a prosthesis. And so I, this gives me this uh, motivation. It gives me this idea that I can this way accelerate my healing. And this will enable me tomorrow to settle different health care issues that I have when I listen to our patients, in fact, that are uh, toxic, comanic, and they're every day, they, uh, every week they try and, get, and go to the pharmacy uh, uh, or the, and the, uh, the, the doctors and the doctors uh, and they try to get prescriptions from the doctors and the doctors just do this. But now how can the idea is how can we let the patients give the desire to really cure? We have the medical staff that wants to really uh, treat and cure and then we have the patient that is motivated. <laughs> That's very, very interesting. So it's not just a, a scientific knowledge, but also to have technology and progress at the service of access to the largest number of people. Yes, of course. I just wanted to say that today I'm working on this process, which is accessible and acceptable, uh, accessible and acceptant. So we talk about this. Accessibility in the world is uh, we have some 80,000 people amputated, and so these prostheses has been developed by, in a collaborative educational form. We work with companies, we work with schools so that the young people have meaning in their professions, so that the companies have the different components, uh, aluminum, for example, so we can uh, produce a, a prosthesis. We're not uh, in a merchandising approach because it is a niche area. Uh, and for the prosthesis. So this uh, a traditional business is not compatible. So I do think this is really the intellectual capacity of human beings. We are going to think differently. We talk a lot about patents today. Yes, uh, okay, we, we, yes, yes, in common good we talk about a lot. Good for the, the majority. And so this element for tomorrow to work together with patients, one element is this element. If we have to liberate uh, data, we also have to liberate the patents so that people that work today in Bangladesh, that they could be vaccinated from COVID and they can go back to work so that the, the, so that the different local store can actually sell their products. So if you have one COVID case, then and it's going to, it's contagious, everyone's going to get it. So it's very important to ask these questions, discuss together about the value of the patent. Today, the patent is a value. It has a value. And it's important to question, why does it have so much value? Can we put the value elsewhere, though? Now, Pierre-Marie, you were talking to us about uh, neuroscience, the dreams, when you talk about the brain. Yes, already. I adore, we talk about dreams, because this science is there to satisfy this notion of progress. And progress, it means to define a, the desirable future and that can be shared. Progress, we have the notion of universality and equity. So the problem is, when we are talking about scientific progress, there are no limits. Yes, Jean-Michel was already talking to about the augmented human being when you had the appearance of the pacemaker. It's true. From this theoretical scientific knowledge already, we have this notion that is desirable. Well, why not him? Uh, I mean, why not me if he has a pacemaker? Why not me? And this something, and it's something which becomes quickly acceptable without having an ethical debate. But it's a really kind of a total debate. What we want to put at the service of mankind for the pro for progress, in other words, scientific progress, technological progress, and its application in the medical field. This is what really causes a problem when we look at the figures of all these arms and other prostheses for different limbs. Obviously, this is not applicable to everyone. So we'll be talking about this now. Uh, we're talking about the application, because when we talk about application, we're no longer just in theory theoretical knowledge. So I ask the question of ethics. What are the limits that exist uh, what, that we actually apply to actually apply this technology or this other one to the health area? Yes, Jean-Michel. Yes, ethics in general terms. This is really the search for the right position between what is, uh, for, which is really something that's a remedy and and in terms based and compared with something that's a poison. So you have potentially both. In fact, you could simply have a continuity application. I'll give you an example, make this more concrete. 
In Grenoble, where you had Lin, the Benabit, Lin, uh, they are specialists of uh, neuronal simulation for those who suffer from Parkinson disease. And they're working a lot about this uh, brain machine surface in a very efficient way. This, of course, is a fantastic opportunity for the Parkinson disease patients. Now, if the same technology is used for in the military area to have an influence on the moods, emotions, of soldiers, that is something different. Well, now what is the limit? Is the intention that we give in the application? The limit, yes, of course, is really what is, we need to term what is desirable. And however, it, it, comes from, uh, it comes from common sense. And, all, and politics, says the moderator, uh, yes, but also common sense, but individually as well as collectively. I want to go back to the patient because we're talking about the patient. We forget that the patient is someone who is suffering. And so that's why we call them a patient. This person is suffering. So what do we do with a man or woman that are suffering? Well, this is the question that we need to ask ourselves especially in the medical field. And I want to go back what, like what Nicola was saying, continue on that line. A patient is suffering from solitude, being lonely. This person suffers from because they have a, 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 an upsetting relation or different difficulties in their social life. And so also, to, they, are, they suffer from having reduction in their autonomy autonomous uh, behavior. So it's not just to repair, because obsession of repairing is an, a mechanical kind of obsession. The doctor, however, is someone who uh, really treats. Don't forget that. To treat a person is not just simply to respond to the dysfunctioning, uh, which is a physiological one of a body. No, it's also to really really take care of this uh, really dysfunctional which uh, aspect which really has an impact on physically and psychologically on a patient I was very sensitive to what I heard yesterday um, in this on these lines when we talk about uh, lendometriosis uh, in fact, the person who was speaking very eloquently said these, the patients, what they want is empathy above all. Yes, this is extraordinary to really express it that way. Yes, this is the limit. The question of the limit is related to knowing how can we really be at the right person? How can we help this person who is suffering? Who, who is expressing their suffering, How? what can we do about that? And that's why I was saying earlier, what really makes me afraid, though, is if you have a medicine without any oral expression, we have to keep oral expression in a world which is favoring digitalization. And so sooner or later, we'll have these tele, uh, in these teleconsultations, we'll have these different conversational uh, persons, icons that will be speaking. They don't have this uh, real, you cannot have this relationship relationship when it's at a distance. So we are really at the limit. We can not just everything that's in healthcare, which is not related to just um, treatment and repair, if we talk about this me mechanist, mechanical area. Now, the limits, uh, more holistically speaking, what are the ethical limits for the utilization of one technology compared to another? For example, this brain implants, um, genetic manipulations of, uh, for human beings. There is this old saying that we formulate this way. Everything that is technically re re realizable it will actually be uh, realized with, in any case. This was a physician. Uh, uh, more before the Second World War. This, uh, uh, yes, we we need to really think about all this. We should not find ourselves in a situation which is ours today, which is to actually do everything that can be actually um, that's feasible. We should not be in a situation, and we should not be 
have this constraint to justify um, what the different innovations that we put on the market. This is an aberration, and this is really a consensus to really this technological obsession which is ours today. So in other words, we should have collective limits. Well, I believe Pierre, Marie, you would like to react? Yes, to say we are not going to stop innovation, but to reintroduce it into a political program, in a societal program, and to is necessary, and to see how this innovation, which could be part of a project for human beings, a human being which is not going out of their ecosystem. And we said all of these different uh, uh, special assets so this human being can rediscover their capacity to act. That's important. We should not forget that. We talk about mankind, humanity, which is better rather than just talking, talking about innovation, which is just to respond immediately. That's what I want to say. This should be a project should be which would would be structured and connected to a future. So how do we do this concretely? Yes, to say that there, we should not be thinking um, real, real time. We should be thinking about the future generation and is to define with this know-how, which is not just from scientists, but also from the religious circles, doctors, philosophers. Uh, yes, a multidisciplinary approach. We saw this with COVID. It was so important that the citizens science, open science, that can respond to all of these essential points. As we've heard from Gunther Anders and Hans Jonas, we have to refound, we have to reconstitute a new ethics, because we, uh, if we don't do that, then we will have this disaster situation, we will have this collapse, so people will be threatened because of, with our emotions, and then we will be far away from science. Now, this idea of uh, these beliefs that could actually falsify debate, how can we go in and have education? How can we ensure that everyone understands the terms we're talking about? Yes, it's exactly my opinion. This is where we have to go. We have to share this know-how, which is too limited, uh, and it's limited to the labs. And we have to really think about what could be the use of the discoveries. This is the uh, ethics by design. I would like to have philosophy and science be closer together at the service of education so that together we can really configure uh, the uh, future that's desirable and can be shared. So people, all of us here in the room, are uh, all should take up uh, this uh, uh, pilgrimage to really actually, yes, take this up. Yes, I believe that uh, being together, we can have really communicate this uh, a multidisciplinary approach at the service of very humanist uh, but not transhumanist vision. Humanist but not transhumanist vision. Yes, Nicola, yes, as what you were saying is very interesting. We realize in our lab, in our human lab, people that come, these are people that are isolated. And so these are people that have this disability. They they cannot work. They are, uh, they, they look normal, but they might, they but they're bipolar and so they cannot work 35 uh, uh, hours a week because of uh, the fact that they're bipolar. We talk about augmented human being, and we think of uh, these people when we see them, when you see an autistic person who sees, uh, or also a myopathic, who is playing uh, games with uh, his, his limbs, not his hands. And so the disability people that actually are really, uh, really left to aside and neglected in our society today. We, in fact, we said these are augmented humans as compared to the society, as people see the society. We all want to show that a person that has a disability, that is considered to be vulnerable or fragile, as people denote it. They can be like everyone else. What we consider as incredible, and now we'll talk about Valdisme, in fact, to be capable, when I go back uh, about this over thing, for the augmented human being is one who really is always questioning himself. He evolves intellectually. And I'll give you three examples. The first one, 
very quickly. The first one, we were saying that uh, intelligence, what we cannot measure in the capacity of being quiet when there are moments. In fact, when we share something on Twitter and we should not do it, so we would economy lots of lots of uh, tweets which really don't say anything. So the capacity to be silent uh, and, and really uh, um, cope with our emotions and to feel capable. And I go over my last sentence. We're in this uh, society of merit. When we want to, we can do this, but I don't agree. I think I, when we can, we can do, we want to do it because when we're capable, then we can do it. We cannot do it because we want to. We do something because we feel capable of doing it. And that's the, the message. Very interesting because you have different uh, points uh, which are overlapping through the points of the pages and ethics and philosophical issues. They are overlapping. Yes, possibility, which is the condition of healing. To be healed is to be in a situation where the possible possibilities are open up again and possibilities are multiple. And you have, uh, different, for example, different opening up different opportunities. So the technological answer is really actually closing possibilities. And so, we, well, to open up on this question of the technological response. Claire, can you share with us what you live in in the area of uh, animal genetics, which is very different from the area of human beings? Now, you, in fact, you have things that could inspire us when we talk about limits. Yes, we confuse uh, different points. I was thinking now the fact that when we have genetic progress, we do have aims, and some are pushed too far, though. And so we do understand uh, better functioning, so but there are advantages and there are disadvantages in this work. So we have to be careful. We have to see what are the changes that we are inspiring, so that we and because we we want to look at the different consequences for different performance, different functions, and the notion of performance must be supported in our different areas. About everything is capacity to it for to adapt cognitive function. Uh, social behavior, etc. What I wanted to add concerning what I've heard is that doctors, they actually do pre prevention and they also heal. When we talk about augmentation, we talk about people that where everything is going well. And then one day this person says, well, look, I would like to have new functions because I don't uh, run quick enough, I don't run far enough, I want to be able to breathe better underwater, etc. And then we say, well, in fact, are these doctors who are going to be addressing these people? They're not sick, but they just want to have new functions. Uh, maybe it's relevant or not, but I'm not going to talk about that. But what I'm saying, you have ergonomics, you have technology behind all this. So, in fact, all the different technological possibilities, will they lead you to different tests? People try to do something. Well, I, I don't know what this will be used. I, won't, I don't know why should I not to try this, even though I don't know the use of this. Or maybe somebody has a real aim for change. And so who should I address? Maybe we're talking about five years, 10 years, 50 years. Uh, so will this be um, a, a doctor that we'll be going to see? Or will it be an ergonomic specialist or et cetera that is actually under, uh, that has to conform with the legislation? And this goes over the question, are we going to be uh, actually inventing new professions, new I want to have additional uh, capacities? We are, you handle this already with animals when you do this uh, kinds of breeding between uh, different animals. Well, this is, of course, a different than with human beings, but how do you really deal with this limit? How, when do you choose to do? Yes, there are things that we haven't chosen very well. There have been some cases that we've seen from these breedings is a, a lot of efforts for productivity. We, we realize that we reduce uh, the genetic diversity. So now we've rolled out uh, genetic diversity. We have new selection of object, uh, objectives, for example, to adapt to climate changes, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we've done a lot of progress in in an area of output. Now we want to have uh, there's uh, functional compromises. We 
So we want to make sure that we have progress which is compatible and we're not going backwards because of this interaction. So we want to have functional comp comprises. Well, thank you very much for all these presentations. The table, the round table is over, but not our debate. We'll have more opportunities to talk further and really be active in this area. Thank you very much. Now we will give the floor to our minister.